I've spent the past month working on the largest tower defense game ever, and I've worked on it enough that we have a fully functional game that is still somewhat performant even with more than 200,000 animated and textured units on a height mapped terrain. A lot of you are probably asking yourself right now, how is this possible? Well, I would make an excuse about covering this topic in another video, but even though I've pretty much talked about optimizations in every video I've made about this particular game, I never really went into too much detail on these optimizations, so let's talk about them. Just a disclaimer, I'm not only going to be talking about optimizations in this video, I will also be introducing the new features that I've added to the game. So if you're more interested in those, look at the chapters on this video and skip to the point that you're interested in. Rendering is probably the biggest bottleneck for performance. There aren't really many ways to render more than 200,000 3D models ordinarily without your computer exploding. So because I think it would be interesting and might be helpful to some of you, and because I haven't done nearly enough unique work on the game to make a full length video with just new features, I thought I'd give an overview of the rendering pipeline of the game today. The main rendering optimization is something called shader instancing. It's pretty much useless in a normal game, and the standard use case for this rendering technique is for creating grass, something which I will never touch. Most release games will implement some sort of instancing to render grass. However, grass is not really a main part of gameplay, so instancing is not really explored. It is left more on the side as a one-time use for rendering grass, or as a cool feature that automatically occurs in a non-intrusive way than more abstract game engines. So it's understandably a very obscure technique. So I guess this video isn't all that useless. Okay, I should probably stop using that sound. Shader instancing in basic terms allows us to draw a large amount of units in only one draw call. By merely sharing common parameters such as the mesh and texture of a unit, we can then pass in unique data such as transformation and color to each instance through the vertex buffer of the shader to actually render them. Although this is simple on paper, a lot of extra work needs to be done to get the system to work, especially in this game where we have a need for animated and textured units. Let's take a look at the actual shader which allows this all to happen. This stuff at the top is standard for most shaders. The vertex struct contains important data such as UVs and normals which allow us to render the model properly once we pass them into the vertex output. We also have an instance position parameter which will offset the vertex by the world position of each instance we are rendering. The rotation and scale parameters have similar roles, all supporting the rendering of each instance. Most of the work is actually being done outside of the shader where we actually mess with the way meshes are being drawn by specifying a rendering pipeline. Notice these inconspicuous uniform variables at the top of our shader. They seem pretty standard, right? Well, these variables are actually only passed in once for each type of mesh being rendered. Whereas non-instance meshes will run the shader once for every single mesh being rendered, at least usually, our instancing system will only pass in parameters like this once for each type of mesh being rendered. Although these optimizations are only minor, they allow us to share parameters such as texture samplers and textures across all of the instance meshes that we are rendering. Additionally, we can specify other uniforms such as an instance index, which allows us to grab the projection matrix of a mesh. This is a big part of how instance rendering works specifically in Bevy. The instance index was kind of a hassle to grab as there was not much documentation on it, but I was still able to find out how to do it after some struggling. Another minor optimization is minimizing the amount of calculations done by the GPU and simplifying the rendering process. This can be partially achieved in the fragment shader, which is responsible for taking vertex data and actually drawing onto the pixels of the screen. Back in the days, I followed a tutorial by JavidX9 about software rasterization and used the CPU instead of the GPU to create a 3D rendering engine. Software rendering is much, much slower than using a hardware-based approach with the GPU, but while following this tutorial, I picked up a simple directional lighting algorithm which I incorporated into this shader because doing actual lighting operations are very expensive. And since doing rasterization on the CPU meant writing normal code to handle the drawing of individual pixels, this is basically what a fragment shader does, so I was able to convert it very quickly into our fragment shader. Anyways, this is largely what makes possible alongside other logic-based optimizations the insanely large amount of units you see on screen. Okay, I think that was a fairly thorough overview of the rendering pipeline. I'm also kind of a newbie with shaders, so if any of you find a way to improve the rendering pipeline, 
I would be very happy to incorporate those changes into the game. Most of the stuff I just mentioned was old news. So what exciting features do we have to present in this devlog? Well, since the past two devlogs have covered the main features of the game, this one is going to focus more on the little details. Let's be honest, does this game look AAA level to you right now? I thought not. Now this is not to say that we are immediately going to improve the quality of this game to the point where we can compare it to the big studio games. The process will be slow, but as a wise man once said, life is a marathon, not a sprint. One big improvement to make the game seem more realistic is adding actual terrain to the game. Currently we just have a plane for the ground. It has this texture added to it but still it's just a plane. So I modeled this terrain mesh in Blender. How are we going to actually use this terrain mesh within the game though? Instead of giving up and googling for some information, I dug through my backlog of 3 year old projects from back when I first started coding, found this old C sharp mono game project where I had converted a terrain mesh to a height map using just its vertex data. And I'm starting to notice a similarity here. So since I'm a change programmer, I of course refactored that code and using a similar algorithm was able to convert my vertices into a height map. I then found this article on bilinear interpolation. I'm pretty sure the algorithm was wrong but I got the general idea so I wrote my own algorithm. This allowed our units to glide smoothly between different points on the terrain instead of just roughly jumping between different heights. I also forgot to mention that I wrote a wave spawning system, or actually I improved upon my old one. In the old wave spawning system, you would need to specify a delay between the different waves in order to get waves to not overlap with each other. But in this new wave spawning system, units aren't all spawned in one big block and are rather spawned in individual rows. Thus the system checks if the row has no units in it and simply adds units when all the rows required to spawn units are empty. This isn't really anything special which is why I didn't spend too much time explaining this feature earlier in the devlog as this is actually the first thing that I implemented when updating the game. Wow what a beautiful day, let's take a look at the sky. Oh wait we don't have one. Alright, let's add a skybox to the game. There is a surprisingly small amount of information on how to do this online, which I'll attribute to the fact that there are so many different ways you could go about doing this. The most accessible method given my current skill set I found online was this video. The technique basically consisted of adding a UV sphere to Blender, cutting off the top and folding the vertices inwards, shading the sphere smoothly, and then adding a texture to the sphere and painting on it using a stencil brush. The stencil brush allowed us to create clouds relatively easily without having to actually have any artistic skill. It was a bit long winded but since I already knew how to use Blender I was able to follow it relatively easily. So that was a lie, following the tutorial was one thing but actually creating a decent skybox was another thing. The first time my skybox was just really messy and it made my game look very low quality. This was because the stencil brush I used had the actual colors of the sky and not just the clouds. So the colors on my texture were all over the place. So I changed the stencil brush by going into a software and erasing the background. Now the stencil brush just allowed me to paint white clouds. Using this technique, I went through almost 5 iterations until I settled on this skybox. I went online and converted the texture into a cube map, wrote some code, and we now had a sky in our game. This definitely helped our game to feel less hacky and more like a real game. I'll probably change the skybox again at a later date but this is definitely enough for now. All of the things we've added to the game thus far are just aesthetic improvements. Let's add a new unit to the game because I feel like the unit I added in the last video looked a bit strange. So I'm scrapping that unit and adding a new giant unit to the game. Following the fantasy theme of the game, I decided to make an ant-like creature to the game, sort of like Treebeard from Lord of the Rings. Starting off in Blender, I remodeled the goblin into a more antish shape. It's nice having a base for every 3D model that I make, because this means I can quickly iterate and maintain a sort of artistic consistency throughout all my units. Of course, I made a lot of changes to the goblin model so that it wouldn't just look like a goblin, 
and then I added some details that only an ant would have. Then I painted this texture onto the model, which gives the ant model a bit more life. It does look a bit cursed, but when did I ever claim to deliver an AA quality game? Okay, I might have promised to make a high quality game, but you can't blame me for being bad at art. Also, I'm sure the art I make will get better over time, and if I ever choose to release the game, this model will be completely reworked anyway. Just a note. You might notice that there aren't really too many vertices in this model, which is why it looks a bit chunky. I could probably make the model look a lot better than this. Because our game values performance above aesthetic, I compromised a bit. Next, I created some animations for our model, which with my current system is extremely tedious. For those who don't know, I'm not able to create animations the traditional way by just rigging the model and moving some bones around. The instancing system which I created can only render static meshes, so I need to create different meshes for each frame of animation, and only then can we have animated models that are also performant and instancing friendly. It kind of ruins the point of instancing, since there are so many different meshes that need to be instanced. But after some testing, the rendering code is still extremely performant, even with animation and different types of units. This was actually extremely surprising because I had originally imagined that animation would be a huge bottleneck for FPS, even with static animation frames. But in practice, this was just not the case. Also, I recently discovered this Blender plugin online, which allows me to batch export 3D models into separate files in just one click. The link for that will be in the description if any of you are interested. So instead of clicking through all of the models and exporting them one by one, this was a nice efficiency boost to my unit creation workflow. The next step for adding a unit into the game is actually adjusting the parameters within my unit type file which will be read at runtime. Additionally, we also need to be adjusting the waves.toml file which basically controls what the game will spawn. And in this list of possible units to spawn, I'm going to be adding in the ent. And here we can see the model in the game. I was extremely happy about this unit because it really fit into the game aesthetically unlike the giant which I had previously created. Unlike the giant which I had previously created. I think it has something to do with proportions and coloring, but I'm pretty happy with the current state of the game. It definitely has potential for expansion, and the workflow for creating stuff is pretty fleshed out. That's it for this devlog. If you enjoyed, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. Have a good day.